So we're going to be focusing predominantly today on guessing the cost of a particular plan. We talked last Monday about ways of transforming one plan into another. Now we'll have a way of uh, assessing which of those two plans is better. Uh, before I get into that, a uh, quick bit of news. Uh, there's a local uh, group of startups, uh, what have you, uh, that organizes a monthly uh, meetup uh, covering various subjects related to databases, practical applications of databases. Uh, there is one of these uh, taking place tomorrow. Um, if you're interested, I encourage you to attend. Uh, it will be in O'Brien 112 on North Campus. Um, the URL up there will get you to the uh, meetup page, and they have one of these every month. Uh, if you're interested, again, I encourage you uh, to attend. Uh, okay, so before uh, before we go down that route, um, I want to do one quick little uh, exercise. So, to the, uh, basically, on uh, at the start of last lecture, uh, y'all and myself were a bit tired. Um, we didn't get too far into uh, what I planned for indexing, so I wanted to approach it from a slightly different angle. Um, so let's actually approach this from the perspective of the design. Starting from a completely blank slate, uh, I would like to come up with a data structure that gets me all of the tuples uh, that match some uh, attribute. I have a particular attribute that I'm looking for, and I'd like to come up with a data structure that gets me all of those attributes. What should I be using? Or, sorry, all of the values that match that particular attribute. What should I be using? A hash index, okay. Can you describe to me how uh, how I would implement one of these? So what's the, uh, what is the uh, what is the hash index built around? The, the primary. Okay, but um, what do what the implementation of a, of a hash? Uh, a hash index or a hash table. Um, what do I, how do I, well first of all, uh, how does it work? What is, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, what value? Okay, so I've got a key and I've got uh, a value. How do I actually um, but so got my key, and I want some something uh, that gets me a uh, value that matches that key. What goes here? What is the, the process by which I find uh, the value? Uh, a hash function. Okay, so I have a hash function. Yeah, and it gets me. Uh, and it gets me my, uh, it gets me something. What do I, what do I, what do I do with this hash function? Okay, so I, I have some, I use this hash function to create matching identifiers. Okay, so I've got uh, x, and I want to find things where these two are equal. Okay, um, but that's sort of a general concept. How do I actually map this to a data structure? Okay, so this, this gives me a number. How do I use that number? Yes. Okay, so I've got an array of a bunch of values, and the hash function tells me which of those values corresponds to a particular key. Okay, great. So I have a nice little data structure here. I give it a key of any size, any, anything can go in the key, the hash function maps it down to uh, 
an array index. Okay. Now what happens if that array doesn't fit on uh, my machine? Um, or alternatively, if it doesn't fit in main memory? Okay, so I need to take this big array and I need to split it. Okay, so I can take it, I can split it, and how do I figure out which uh, page, uh, which page a particular value is going to be stored in? buckets 
and these lists are going to get bigger and bigger. So what's our lookup time going to be if we have 10 uh, pages worth of data in this? Uh, you had the right answer to speak up. Linear time in the in the depth. Uh, and how the, how deep is the list? Okay, it could be all the elements, but on average, how how long are these lists going to be? Okay, so in this case, if we have 32 buckets, we have uh, one each of these buckets would contain one thirty second of all of the values. Okay, what do we do about that? Build an index over each of these values, and you just have to 
index to replace this page. So,
relation line for expressions that might be desirable. Yes? Okay, so if we have a selection sitting on top of a join or a cross product, often we'll want to push the, uh, the selection into the join or under the join uh, so that we're joining over less data. Uh, great, any others? If I have a cross product sitting somewhere, what, what might I want to do with it? Do you like cross products? No, good. Um, so what, what can we do to a cross product to uh, maybe lessen its impact? Great, so if there's a selection condition sitting somewhere near it, we might be able to take that cross product and turn it into a join. So there's a couple of these rules. Uh, oh, um, what about file scan operators? Anything we can do with those? Maybe not necessarily always, but is there anything we can do with a file scan operator? Let's 
say my page looks kind of like this. I've got a bunch of couples. How would, can, it, can I combine projection with, uh, with this file to reduce the amount of data that I need to read? I see. So as I'm scanning, I don't necessarily need to, uh, I can immediately drop this part of this, the file scan. Okay, that's a really nice optimization. There's uh, one case where it really pays off. Um, so did, out of curiosity, did anyone measure where your costs were going? Where your, um, when you were running your, your queries in, in checkpoint one, did any, anyone uh, do any sort of optimization, sorry, any sort of uh, measurement of which operators were taking how much time? Okay, so cross product was taking a lot. Uh, any other operators that were that were aggregate? Okay, so the aggregate was taking up a lot of time. I O I O. And what specifically about? So. Distinct. 
So uh, that hopefully addresses that concern. Uh, the second one was that you might be projecting away attributes that are irrelevant. So if I have a, uh, my query looks like that. If some, this goes to something, and then I have this, do you agree that it is correct to combine these two? OK, so by all of the rewrite rules, all the crazy stuff we talked about on Monday, if we can get the formula into this configuration, then we can combine it. Um, otherwise, I agree. Uh, we, there are shortcuts you can take, but uh, before you take a shortcut, prove to either yourself or to me that it is correct by some combination of rewrite rules that uh, you can apply. Does that address your concerns? Yes? Is it really? Can it really optimize? Because if you have a fine limited data, then you can run this case. You can never be sure about its exact location. The data that we have to be And what we we'll end up doing is that we we'll end up uh, traversing to it. So we we'll checking by character by character whether it is or this is where our strings are. See, uh, the uh, you are completely correct. Um, the, but I'm, so to respond to that, uh, can I get a little bit of uh, context? Where, uh, where are you responding to specifically? I mean, that, uh, I was talking about optimizing projection. Optimizing using. Okay. So, uh, so there's some. Okay. So uh, is it is merging those two a good idea in general? Is that the uh, uh, projection I I just have said it first name from there. Can I really be a specific data from that? Uh, so there are there th there's one benefit that has been uh, one major benefit that has been so far been proposed, and that's that the amount of data that you're passing between operators goes down. Um, two major benefits. Uh, one, that the amount of data that you're passing between operators goes down. Uh, the second being that if you know that you're going to discard certain columns, then work you might want to do post-processing. Once you've already read, you potentially already need to read in all of the records. But if after you've read in all of the records, uh, if you still then need to parse out columns three, four, and five, uh, and you don't care about one, two, six, or seven, um, especially if you're working with CSV files, and if, uh, if any of you end up working with MapReduce or any of these uh, NoSQL database systems, this is incredibly important for that. Um, because parsing in those columns, uh, just Converting an a string to an integer or a string to a date, that takes a considerable amount of computation. And, if you can see, and because it happens so often, because it happens once on every uh, couple of bytes over a multi-gigabyte data file, shaving off that little bit of computation is going to help you a lot. Um, so you're, you're, no, you, uh, uh, you can't, uh, you do need to read everything into memory, uh, using that particular layout. Um, what I was kind of getting at earlier is that there are certain, if I were to restructure my data in, in some way, I'd like you to think about this because we're going to get back to it later in the term. But if I, there are ways of restructuring. This is a fairly easy one. Um, how might I restructure my? Let, let's let's pick it up. How might I restructure my data? Maximum of the characters, then I, would, I might want to find 
Okay, so I can I can say that this is 15 characters, this is 15 characters, this is 15 characters. So I know the whole thing is 45 characters. So if I want to read out the second attribute, I go 15 characters, read one, go another 15, uh, 45 characters, read one, and keep doing that. Does this save me any I.O. costs? Okay, so, so depending on the kind of uh, data store you're using, yes, you can save yourself potentially a little bit. Uh, the, the downside is that you are still major cost of reading these in is going to be the IOs. So if I'm reading in a block at a time, I'm not going to save myself a lot by skipping to different points in the block. Um, yes? Yeah, that's what I There are some systems that actually uh, do rely on human readable data storage. Um, this occurs very frequently in systems like MapReduce. Uh, and a lot of scientific applications, it's really important to, um, I've worked with a number of scientists and I've had colleagues who've worked very extensively uh, creating scientific uh, analysis tools and uh, one of the things that comes up very frequently is that they don't want to be locked into a certain database system. Uh, they don't want to, they want their data to be stored uh, in a CSV file because they can take a CSV file, they can do whatever data processing uh, they want over it. And if you provide them with a new tool, you're the one who has to adapt to their standards, not the other way around. So uh, that's an example of an analytics case where you would be reading. So, without spending too much more time on this, uh, one thing to think about is that what I'm doing here is grouping all of the data by row. Do I need, what if I grouped everything by column? Something to think about. We'll, we'll be talking about that considerably more uh, towards the end of the term. Okay, wow. All right. Um, you know what? Let's, let's take a quick intermission right now and uh, get you out of this in five minutes. So, nothing was wrong with our making this for every year.
the basic uh, challenge. Uh, so there's there are a lot of different free uh, rights that don't necessarily provide um, sort of a guaranteed reduction in execution time. So uh, associativity of join, for example, or commutativity of join. Um, there's a number of different orders in which we can evaluate a join, uh, and all of them are typically uh, equivalent in terms of uh, correctness. Uh, they might not, however, be equivalent in terms of cost. And we'd like to have uh, a general purpose way of identifying which of them, uh, which of these different equivalent plans is the best. So the, the high level approach that, uh, that I'm going to present now is that we try and come up with some idea of how much a plan is going to cost before we actually run it. Now, uh, the cost estimation is, uh, at best, a bit of an inexact science. Uh, anyone who's watched Progress Bargo, uh, well, can sometimes be uh, imprecise. So, this, the, the bulk of what we're going to discuss today is going to be heuristics, it's going to be guesswork, it's going to involve a whole bunch of assumptions. And then over the next day or two, uh, the next class or two, we're going to try and uh, clean up some of those assumptions and, and uh, simplify them, make them a little more, uh, let, a little less assumption and a little more uh, well-designed heuristic. So, I just want to uh, put that out there, that what we're talking about right now is going to be basically very, very high level, very guesswork, very uh, 15 minutes, 6 days, 30 seconds. Um, so in order to do that, we first need, before we try to estimate uh, a cost, we first need to have some idea of what the cost is. So. Uh, what might be some good uh, costs to use when, when trying to estimate uh, the cost of a plan? Yes. File set. Uh, what do you mean by the price of the price of the price? Okay. So how would you express that as a cost? So if I'm uh, I'm creating a document together, so I can uh, check the size of the file. Depending on the number of columns that they have, I can have a bit of estimate of how many goes to Okay, so the file, the size of a file is a metric that might go into a cost, but I wouldn't classify it as a cost in and of itself. Um, data is just data uh, until you actually try and measure something. Uh, what is it that you're doing with the data file in this case. Reading, yeah, so you're reading them in. You're, uh, the cost in this case, you're, you're right, the, uh, the size of the file contributes, uh, but the well, one particular metric that we might want to use in that case is the cost of taking the file and reading it into memory. Um, any other costs? Number of columns. Um, once again, that's a property of the data. How would that translate into uh, something that... Uh, file size, file I.O., uh, we have to 
there's a certain time cost associated with reading data into memory. How would you uh, express the uh, time cost of uh, a set of comments? Uh, the file size. What about an index? 
So what would the cost be uh, of index scan in terms of number of IOs and number of
giving you uh, a function which takes in uh, a constraint, uh, sorry, condition, and a uh, number of couples. And it produces a number of couples uh, for a selection. How does that apply to an index scan?
So really what I'm trying to get at here is that it's really important to be able to estimate the cost of a selection operator. And uh, yes? What about who lives? What do you mean two levels? Who lives? Oh, um, two relations. Uh, can you uh, convey the full query? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, then that the already sorted on that particular column so that we can reduce the number of tables we are going to read. That's what I want to write. So that we are in this selection and selection operator and the index operator. Um, what about the hash index data structure that we came up with earlier today? Does the data, data need to be sorted in that case? So as long as the data is indexed in some way. Um, with a B-tree, you're completely right. Uh, a B-tree assumes that the data is in sorted order. Um, the precise layout of the data depends entirely on the index that you're building on top of it. So if you're building a hash index, uh, it doesn't need to be sorted. If you're building a B-tree index, it does need to be sorted. Um, all of this is, I'm uh, a regular file scan operator reads me all of the tuples in a file, but I could potentially combine that with a selection predicate like we discussed on Monday and get better performance by using an index. And all an index scan operator is, uh, I'm sorry for not uh, properly defining my terms here, uh, an index scan operator is just an index lookup. It's using an index uh, to answer, to find a, a set of tuples that match a specific criteria. Um, and the, the goal here is to be able to uh, estimate the uh, number of tuples that are produced by an index scan operator. So, all right, popping the stack a little bit. Um, we've, we've mentioned that, the, that it's important to be able to compute not just the I.O. cost and the uh, CPU cost of a given operator. We want to be able to determine the number of tuples produced by that operator as well. So uh, So far, we've encountered three different operators, selection, index scan, and file scan. File scan produces how many tuples? Uh, higher, yeah, all the rows. Uh, and my point is that the other two operators we've encountered so far are essentially the same. As long as we have some way of uh, estimating the number of uh, outputs produced by a selection operator, we can guess that. So what kind of, if, we have, if I have an arbitrary selection predicate, let's say uh, A is equal to 3, what kind of statistics would I need to gather about my data in order to be able to answer uh, the number of tuples that uh, have A is equal to 3? statistics would be to run the entire query. Uh, and if I had that information, I'd also have a query answer. So, uh, um, so the oftentimes what we we'll want to do is not, uh, rather than running the entire query, I'd, also, I'd like to be able to guess, uh, to have some summarized uh, information about the table that allows me to easily guess uh, what the answer is, or how many answers I'm going to get. Um, so for A is equal to 3, what kind of, uh, how might I summarize all of the data in A, uh, all the data in, in this relation, uh, in such a way that I might be able to easily guess uh, how many values A is going to, A is equal to 3 is going to produce? Okay, so how many possible values of A are there? Um, 